Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AusCert. As you see there on your screen, the 16th annual AusCert Cybersecurity Conference. My name's Adam Spencer. Really excited uh, to be your MC again for this wonderful celebration of all things cybersecurity. We've got a couple of amazing days lined up for you. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet today, the Comba Merry people, and thank them for their custodianship of this land. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, not the first time I've done also about 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, some, some integer N where N is less than 16. Time that I've... Hello, tough crowd, move on. <laughs> that I've been here. And I really... I love this, this celebration, this community, and this great sense of friendship that's in the room. I do know that many of you here would be here with a couple of partners, a couple of associates. There's a pretty good chance that if you know anyone in the room quite well, you're probably sitting next to that person. At the same time, with all of you, there'll be a group of people in the room who you have absolutely no idea who they are. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to get everyone to stand up. Everyone's going to stand up right now. Everyone just stand up for a second. I'm about to count to three. When I hit the number three, you're going to spin around 360 degrees and the first person you lock eyes with and think, I've got no bloody idea who you are, you're going to extend the Auscert hand of friendship, shake hands, and then introduce yourself. Explain who you are and how you fit into this magic couple of days. One, two, three, spin around, find someone you don't know, shake hands, who are you? How do you fit in? Fantastic. Okay, there you go. Now everyone back at me, looking back at me now. Everyone back to me. Excellent stuff. Let me run through a couple of items of housekeeping before we kick off our speakers for the morning. In the unlikely event of an emergency here at the resort, there'll be a public address announcement in conjunction with an evacuation tone. Just follow the instructions of the well-trained staff and we move to Acacia Avenue, just on the southern side of the hotel if we do have to evacuate. Bathrooms, exit the room, left and left again. You'll see the signs on the walls. Phones, obviously we're all connected, we're all very digital. Please have them on silent um, out of respect for our speakers. Uh, of course, this is a non-smoking venue here in the hall. This hall is uh, non-smoking. Uh, just outside in the uh, registration area and the display area is non-smoking. Downstairs in the foyer and the uh, restaurant area, that's non-smoking. Immediately outside the hotel resort there is non-smoking, as is around the pool. That's also a non-smoking area. Um, the street just out the front of the resort here is uh, non-smoking. Look, if you want to have a cigarette, the best thing to do is get up from your chair, walk out through that door at the back, turn left, left again, get to the stairs, go down the stairs, walk through the foyer of the hotel, immediately out the front of the hotel, go across onto the main street there, turn to the left, hail a cab, get in the cab, uh, go to the Gold Coast Airport, go to the international section of the airport, buy yourself a ticket to Bali, and once you get to Denpasar Airport, go absolutely crazy, okay? That's the best way to have a cigarette over the next couple of days. You've got that. I presume everyone has the mobile app. You should have the mobile app. It's AusCert 2017. If you don't, I'm sure you're all connected to that already. But there's a few of you who aren't. Get onto that app right now. It's the best way to ask questions of the presenters, rate the presentations, check in at the booths using the passport to win prizes and the like. The merchandise stand is open during the catering breaks at the conference. That's where you go to get your very stylish AusCert t-shirt and conference bag. The lockpicking village. If this is your first AusCert, it's one of the highlights of AusCert. The lockpicking and Lego booths are both down the end of the corridor that way in the interactive zone, pick up your lock picking kit and practice lock and USB. The hashtag for all your different social media is OzCert2017. So use that on Twitter, on uh, Instagram, Snapchat, Tinder, whatever you're into, get OzCert2017 out there and spread the message. The gala dinner tonight, which absolutely goes off each year, um, is absolutely booked out as always. So if you have realised now you can't go to the gala dinner, and you have booked in, please go to the registration desk and unbook yourself because there is a wait list of people. If you'd still like to go, go and let them know at the registration desk. If we will squeeze you in at all, uh, we will do that. Now, to our first speakers to welcome us officially on behalf of us. So look, if there's one thing that we've learned, I think, around the world in the last 18 months or so, is um, executive power can be quite a fickle mistress, um, elusive to obtain, and then once obtained, even more difficult to keep. Uh, look at the United Kingdom, for example, where uh, David Cameron was wiped out uh, in the Brexit vote and had to resign 
the uh, Prime Ministership in Australia. Malcolm Turnbull, of course, bet it all on a double dissolution election, scrapped back in by the skin of his preferences. And in the US, they were given the choice between a megalomaniacal billionaire narcissist and Donald Trump. <laughs> and we all saw what happened there. So how are we? Uh, how happy are we here at Oz to know that amid the turmoil that engulfs us worldwide, we can go to sleep at night, safe and calm, in the warm, reassuring bosom of this dynamic leadership duo. Strong, stable, just a little bit sexy. Please welcome David Stockdale and Mike Home from Oz to the stage, ladies and gentlemen. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much, Adam. I don't think I've ever, ever had an introduction quite that good. But hello. Hello to everybody. Okay, so as Adam says, my name is David Stockdale, and I'm the uh, Deputy Director at the University of Queensland with responsibility for OzCert. So from OzCert and from the University of Queensland, I'd like to say uh, welcome to each and every one of you to OzCert 2017, the 16th conference. So I'm relatively new to, uh, to cyber security, and there are two lessons that I've learned really, really quickly over the last six months. Firstly, as we move to a more digitally connected world, we, we need to increase everyone's cyber awareness, cyber, cyber security awareness. This is everyone's problem and possibly one of the greatest threats that we'll face. Secondly, the only way that we're going to battle the bad guys and have any success is by working together, which of course is borne out in the theme of the conference, which is United We Stand. So I'm not going to do any big presentations. I know that you're all here because you've got an interest in this field. So I hope you get a lot of value from the next few days. If you'd like to know more about OzCert, come visit us at the booth. And I look forward to meeting as many, as many of you as possible during the conference. Have a great time, and I'll let me hand over to Mike. Thank you. Right, well, thank you everyone for coming along and welcome. It's really, really good to see you all here. We've actually got about 700, which is, I believe, close to the capacity of the venue, so um, that's, that's wonderful. There's people from nine different countries and we've got about uh, 360 of you are, are actually OSET members, so that's wonderful. Um, we've got, a, as David said, we've got some really exciting uh, speakers too, so uh, I'm really looking forward to the talks. I'm going to speak very, very briefly because I know you're just itching to see our, our keynote. Um, uh, David mentioned very briefly why we chose United We Stand for our theme, and it really comes back to uh, the operational focus that we have at OSCERT. Um, in, in the operations team, uh, one of our main things this year is, is information sharing. Um, as David said, the only way we can get there is together. So there's been a lot of excitement in the team about that. We've got some really good uh, technology that we're piloting at the moment with, uh, with some of our members. When the time is right, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll explain that to all of you and I think you'll, you'll be really excited by what we've done. Um, the uh, events team at OSCERT sort of picked up on, on that excitement and uh, they sort of wanted to share the cyber love. So um, with information sharing and uh, everyone working together in the community, we just decided United We Stand was, was the best way to articulate that. So uh, here we are, and uh, one thing that I would uh, definitely encourage you to do is come and put some faces to, to names. Many of you interact with uh, the operations team at OSCERT through our, our member chat, uh, good old-fashioned IRC. Some of you prefer email, telephone, um, but either way, it's, it's just, uh, at the end of the day, it's just text. So uh, please come and put a visual to, to the, uh, the, the names that you know so well. Um, very, very easy to spot. We all have these wonderful uh, blue Smurf shirts. So um, come, and, come and find us at the stand. Our stand's just over here in the exhibition hall. Um, speaking of the exhibition hall, uh, while you're out there, please uh, chat to some colleagues. Um, visit our, our wonderful sponsor overlords who make this uh, brilliant event possible. Um, make some new cyber friends, maybe join a, an industry initiative. We have out here in the exhibition hall, we have Acer represented. Um, you'll find our, our branch chapter for Brisbane, uh, Mandy Turner, out at the, uh, at, at the stand. So uh, I'd encourage you to support Acer. 
Um, now we've, uh, at OSIRT, we've also supported CERT Australia as the national CERT for a number of years now, um, and their responsibility, of course, with critical infrastructure. But this year, we're actually really excited to have um, the ACSC represented here with the IRAP program. It's down the far end of the, the hall. Um, and uh, as, as you've already heard, there's, there's some of your old favourites here as well. We've got the Career Cafe and uh, the Lego Pit. So I think we have a, a, a wonderful um, event ahead of you. And I think the best thing for me to do is to hand over to the people that really know how to entertain, um, one of them being Adam. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, guys. OK, let's move now to our opening keynote. One of our speakers will be familiar to you if you were at OzCert last year or as a tutorial a couple of days ago. I could do the whole bio, imagine the whole phone freak scene, founder of Hack5 and all that. All I need to say is he is the defending champion of the prestigious OzCert speed debate extravaganza, which will be on again tomorrow afternoon to round out the conference. And he's brought a special friend with him, a podcasting legend and Hack5 guru, Shannon Morse, joined by Darren Kitchen. Please give Darren and Shannon a big round of applause. They're here to talk about exploiting the universal attack vector. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recording for my own vlogs while I'm doing this. <laughs> so first off, I wanted to ask, who out here went to the whiskey tasting last night? Oh, I see a lot of hands, wow. I'm surprised you're awake. I'm assuming it was a good time, though? Yeah? Good, very good. So first off, I want to say thank you so much to OSCERT 2017 for having us down here. This is amazing. It's also my first time down in Australia. So I just want to say it's great to be in Down Under. Am I doing this right? That's how you do it, right? <laughs> So today, we decided that we wanted to have some fun. We decided that we wanted to perform an attack that takes advantage of the root of security, which, of course, is trust. And everybody loves trust. Another thing that we all love and we wanted to take advantage of is convenience, because everyone loves convenience. We also wanted to do an attack that takes advantage of that fundamental nature of the human's relationship with technology. So, of course, given that this is the first keynote of the day, we wanted to have some fun. So we aren't dropping any zero days, but what we are dropping are lots and lots of USB flash drives. I've never gotten to do that before. It was awesome. So much fun. So we're also going to be dropping a takeaway as well for everybody who is here and everybody that will see this online as well that hopefully you can use for your future security engagements and also will hopefully bring in some money for the IT field from your CEOs. <laughs> but in traditional Hack5 fashion, I will say that what we're going to be doing here, you know, yeah, it's pen testing, yeah, it's infosec, but us, we're hackers in the old school sense, so we got into a little bit of mischief, a little, little hijinks, we're keeping it fun, but hopefully it's something that you can take away and use to not only just teach some unsuspecting targets why plugging in random USB drives isn't the best idea, but also so you can take this takeaway back to your organization and use it for your own security awareness training. And like Shannon said, maybe get some funding along the way. Yay, fun! I mean, I have to say, though, if you saw that, you would not pick that up, right? Right? Exactly. You would not let somebody else plug that into your computer, right? I would All right. Not. Quick, quick question, just you know, to kind of gauge the audience. You know, I, I remember you guys from last year, but I, I kind of, you know, I want Shannon to know that she's among friends. Just <laughs> from your own personal experience, can you tell me about about how long does it typically take you to uh, walk in and rob a bank? I know. I used to work at a bank. I should well, have mentioned that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I recently went to uh, Beirut, Lebanon, with Jason Street to find out. And I'll show you that right here. This is courtesy of National Geographic's breakthrough documentary that just aired. Hello. Hello. 
<laughs> I can't help but laugh, it's so good. <laughs> All right, so if you guessed about, what, 15 seconds to just walk into a so bank? So bad, so bad. With a USB drive, find an unlocked machine and plug it in? How is that possible, right? We're <laughs> gonna get into the attack and all of that, but it helps me to introduce the world's most lethal cyber villain. If you are here last year, maybe familiar, in fact, with the world's most lethal cyber villain, Yes, I'm talking about grandma. <laughs> she is awesome. She bakes amazing cookies. It's true. She's wondering why you're not calling more often. <laughs> and she is my stand-in for the industry's need for user-friendly. She's also elite hacksaw. And she may be potentially responsible for Stuxnet, the world's first known cyber weapon, right? Used USB for its propagation against Iranian centrifuges, which enrich uranium, you know, the stuff that goes boom. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that grandma's nefarious, but in the 90s, the PC boom, when all of these standards were taking place that we all take for granted now, everything needed to be user-friendly, and as such, to be convenient, a lot of hard-coded trusts were put in. Mm -hmm. And those same trusts get passed on to the user and it could turn an unsuspecting target into a victim when plug and play turns into plug and pwn. Huh? Do I sound cool, Shannon? No, you don't. Honestly. You would sound cool if you said it right. It's own. All right. It's not pwn. <laughs> well, it's all about the man-machine trust relationship. You know, it's a relationship that can so easily be exploited through, well, the ubiquity of not just USB ports, but really the whole physical attack surface. Right? It's all literally built. I.O. is built on that trust relationship. And if you're crafty, if you're sneaky, if you get physical access to one of these ports, for just 10 seconds, you can go from plug to pwn and know you have a successful attack by something as easy as a green LED. Well, it could also be a purple LED, too. I mean, it's easy enough. But seriously, though, not us. We are information security professionals. We are influencers in this industry. So, of course, we would not fall for these kind of attacks. I mean, sure, of course, we laugh and we cry whenever our colleagues get totally owned by these kind of things, and again, it's owned. I mean, we would seriously face palm if these kind of things happen to our colleagues. But again, and I love Star Trek. I mean, how could you not? TNG, man, it's the best. But seriously, I, we are not going to be the ones that fall for these, right? Right? Well, in this talk, we're going to be talking about this important vulnerability, as it were, that just so this attack factor that happens to be the de facto way that humans interface with computers and technology, and see how effective it really is. See what other researchers have found, and do a little experiment of our own. And take a look at some of the mitigation techniques out there. Like I said, leave you guys with a little gift, a payload you can use on your own internal security awareness engagements. Mm -hmm. But first off, we should probably introduce what we do. Usually we say... I'm Darren Kitchen. And I'm Shannon Morse, and this is your weekly dose of Technolust. Welcome to this episode of Hack 5. At least that's what we usually say on our weekly podcast called Hack 5. It's been influencing the security industry with really fun technological tutorials uh, that have been bringing people into their careers since 16, 17 years ago. So we've been going for a little while. Uh, I think one of my personal best things, one of my favorite things is when everybody out here or several of you have come up and told me personally that you have really enjoyed the show since you were kids, and now you have a profession, a career in the security industry, and that means so much to us. And in addition to making fun podcasts, we've also been developing an arsenal of penetration testing equipment with funny names like pineapple and duck and turtle and bunny. They're so cute. It, it also, cute is very important. Yes. You know, I started as a phone freak. <laughs> Uh, in the 90s where we didn't have cute little pineapples and ducks and turtles. We had different colored boxes. We had beige boxes and blue boxes and red boxes. 
all so that we could take advantage of inherent trust that were built into the phone system and get some free long distance, you know, dial those really good BBSs. And I feel like it's really important as an industry that we maintain the hacker culture and keep it cute. Because mm -hmm. there's seriously nothing better Very than important. when you're on the phone with that uh, high level official from the government that's trying to buy a bunch of USB rubber duckies and they're literally on the phone like, there's no way I'm getting this PO approved. You guys got a <laughs> SKU number or something I can use? And I'm like, yep. It's rubber dash ducky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but enough about us. We should po probably talk about the dangers of ubiquity. Uh, specifically, USB flash drives. Everybody loves them. They're stable. They're reliable. They're really inexpensive. They're easy to use, and they're readily available. Seriously, you can find them everywhere. Uh, as we have seen for the past several years, pricing has exponentially decreased as storage space has gone up. I'm sure you remember how 128 gig flash drives back in 2013 were twice the price of what they are now. So price has gone down quite a bit. In fact, according to the Global Industry Analysts, Inc., we should expect to have 556.2 million units of USB flash drives shipped worldwide annually by 2020. Annually. It's a lot of flash drives. And of course, that's because of things like speed and cost and reliability, everything, everything that consumers love. Computers love them too, as you can see, they're simply just plug and play. And they're cross-compatible. You can use them with Linux and Mac and Windows. And they're fast enough for a consumer to be relatively happy. Even with this new thing called hashtag dongle life, I'm sure you're all familiar with dongle life. I know I am. Personal devices have become, even this example right here, it's small and thin, it's portable, it's light, and there's barely any ports on it. <laughs> USB drives, they still work. You can find them at trade shows, events, conventions. I wonder if anybody was handing out flash drives at this convention. Be careful. Open them. Just make sure. Just check. You can see them at checkout lines at convenience stores and even as a handy little add-on item whenever you're checking out online, whenever you're shopping for your family and friends during the holidays. They're available all over the, way, all over the world because of something that we all love, which is consumption. Oh, yes. So they still have a cultural significance. And because of that, we can also theorize that there's still a problem as well. At least that's what I think. If you ask the Poneman Institute about USB drive security, you'll quickly find you know, the top 10 USB drive security best practices. Uh, I'm not going to go through them. I'm just going to say, uh, interestingly enough, sponsored by Kingston, all about educating users about encrypting drives and not losing drives. And you know, providing employees with approved, high-quality USB drives for the workspace. <laughs> I did mention it is uh, sponsored by Kingston, right? Mm -hmm. But the major takeaways, you know, suffice it to say, most of the education in that is all about you know, limiting what USB flash drives you use and how they're allowed to be used and setting policies for encryption and things of that nature to minimize data breaches, but not necessarily preventing any sort of other physical access attacks. Right. So we posit a couple of questions. Do we as security professionals actually practice what we preach? Do we trust random USB flash drives? Hmm. So cue a USB drop. And of course, everybody knows what a USB drop is. It's where a penetration tester takes some sort of amount of USB flash drives or rubber duck and sits them out at a target location, drops them in various different places to try to gain access through some sort of pivot point to a network, through a company, perhaps. So in our case, we decided to use the USB rubber ducky. And of course, what the duck? That's what we have to ask. Well, I'm going to just let a few TV shows answer that question for us, because I've explained it way too many times at conventions. <laughs> There it is. Okay, this is a rubber duck. All else fails. You find an FBI laptop anywhere on the floor. They're usually Panasonic Toughbooks. Plug this guy in. 
Wait 15 seconds, then yank it. Okay? Thanks to a tool called Mimikatz, it'll pull all cache passwords and domain info in and save them on this. Won't uh, give us everything, but might help lead us somewhere. Just a backup plan. Okay, let's, uh, let's try again. That's Darren! Hello, where are the two rubber duckies from Vegas? There are a couple of rubber duckies okay, here cool. if you want to use them. Yeah. No, you had two that were already set up, so it's like... Yeah, those are set up too. I don't remember what payloads they're running though. Okay, I will definitely test those. I have no problem putting it into my computer. <laughs> right? Just... What is the worst that could happen? <laughs> just unplug it if it starts doing anything really nefarious. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just Hello World. See, I like that. Basically, the rubber ducky is a keyboard. I can't type you know, 35,000 words a second. This can. So it, when it plugs in, it goes and says, I'm a keyboard and I'm typing. It can literally open up Notepad and instead of saying hello world, write the program, the Trojan or the malware, write it, save it, execute it, and then go. All done inhumanly fast because it's already pre-recorded on the chip. Bro, well, you all right? What's wrong? Everything. This one's my favorite. <laughs> Everything's wrong. Sir, I did as you it's ordered. So funny. And isolated all the malicious code, or remenants of it, buried deep in our operating system. At first I was confused. Our fire And then I was petrified. <laughs> I realized the only way we could have been breached was through social engineering, or physical access with a rubber ducky. A what? keystroke injection attack platform disguised so as a thumb drive. <laughs> it would bypass all standard countermeasures by emulating a plug-in keyboard, reprogramming our host computer as if the hacker was manually typing in the code. Still, the culprit would have to plug in the thumb drive. Yes. Someone had to do an FBI employee with level four clearance. I spent the last 18 hours collating logins with the first appearance of the malicious code in order to figure out who got punked so, so we could interview the employee and nail that hacker. And it was you. <gasps> <gasps> okay, new spoilers. No! Seriously, I love that. He was basically like reading the website. <laughs> he was reading our Wikipedia entry. It's fantastic. <laughs> I have to say though, bragging rights, I mean, <laughs> that's so cool. The USB rubber ducky was on TV. That's awesome. So anyway, let's get into it. That was the USB rubber ducky. We're taking advantage of first, that machine to human trust. And there's many different trust factors. This first one, machine to human. So this is where you get that violation of trust that machines have in humans whenever we use devices called HIDs, which are human interface devices. And in this case, the USB rubber ducky is taking advantage of a USB keyboard. Now there is, in computers, this super hard-coded trust in any kind of keyboard input. Computers automatically think, oh, it must be a human. It's fine. Yeah, it's totally fine. Yeah, they're not gonna like rise up or anything. No, of course not. Because humans are good. Humans are good people. Yeah, please don't kill us, okay? Please don't kill us, computers. So computers respect that relationship. They accept any kind of unauthenticated keystrokes that come their way without question because they automatically think, it's a human. Humans can't do any bad. We're also going to violate that human-to-human -human trust, you know, what hackers like to call social engineering, right? <laughs> I just like to call it manipulating and lying to get what you want. But either way, you know, it's, it's that skill that we learned as kids yep. to manipulate our parents, you know? It's like a hard-coded human attack. I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, the trick was you would first go and ask dad, right? That way, if he said no, you could just real quick run over and ask mom. And as long <laughs> as you got to them before they had a chance to sync up, you were golden. Yep. Which uh, in InfoSec is also known as a race condition. And then the third one that we have is human to machine trust. The ducky looks like a keyboard, so the computer doesn't ask, is that really a keyboard or is it a rubber ducky? It doesn't know the difference. It just accepts it no matter what because it wants to give consumers that convenience. And convenience means that the consumer, or the computer, obviously is going to know best, right? Well, we humans are going to trust them, those machines. We don't necessarily want to ask or give the time to ask. There's not gonna be a program on the USB rubber ducky, or the flash drive in this case, or a keyboard, that runs unless I tell it to. So it's, we accept it, we trust those machines. 
We also aren't going to ask. You know, the computer doesn't know a human interface device from a USB rubber ducky. It's going to automatically assume that everything is okay. So we trust the computer. But that doesn't mean that humans are stupid. Not at all. We are not saying that humans are stupid. I'm saying that humans are conditioned to think that way over the course of time that we have had with this technology. And what we are saying is that we need to change the way that we think. We need to start policing our own trust in that technology. And it's changed a lot, that trust that we have in machines, as the rise of smartphones and those locked down operating systems that run on the phones and tablets, you know, uh, in addition to those voice assistant butlers, right? You know, they do a really good job of preventing us from hosing our systems, unlike a general purpose PC, and it's in stark contrast to that, right? right. You know, your, your Siri's and, and Alexa's and OK Google's of the world are kind of like, I, to, to quote Zay Frank, thinking so you don't have to. So we've just gotten so used to the computer knowing what's best. And these attack vectors, they exist because of convenience, and that problem isn't gonna go away anytime soon. Because as a society, we expect convenience. Mm -hmm. if, you ask, if you ask Carolyn Schmidt, she's the program manager for IT security awareness training uh, over at Education NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards of Technology. She says that removable media are portable, convenient, and easy to use to exchange information. And prohibiting the use of all removable media is just not reasonable. Moreover, Using removable media safely depends very heavily on the user's own judgment, mm -hmm. awareness, and diligence, which means that the responsibility, you know, the onus ends up on the user. And we as users, we as a society, we expect to have technology that just works. But as developers, as systems administrators, we're tasked with making things that just work, which means that typically we need to put in hard-coded trusts. And then as hackers and as penetration testers, when it comes to breaking those hard-coded trusts, it's oftentimes a matter of just telling the right simple lie. <laughs> Something that we have all learned to do from childhood. Exactly. So we decided to do our own USB drop and ask that question again, do we as an industry practice what we preach? We are so good at giving really sound, really good advice, but do we actually follow our own guidelines? We always think, that's not gonna happen to me. I'm an expert. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to run antivirus. For example, we did <laughs> this whole, there it is, an informal poll. 40% of InfoSec professionals don't even run antivirus, for various reasons, of course, but it's not just antivirus, it's also public wireless, it's not using a VPN, it's trusting USB flash drive, it's, it's leaving your PC unattended when you go to the restroom at a coffee shop. Everybody does it. Well, also, I'm an expert, you know, I, I'm an InfoSec expert, I know what right. I'm doing, and that's just gonna slow down, you know, my yeah. frames per second in Counter-Strike, so course. come on. I mean, I've done it too. I, sometimes I don't use a VPN because I want to watch Netflix. I mean, it happens. So even for this example, RCI tweeted, let's play a game. Spot the unlocked laptops, which are owned by forensics and penetration students. Which, of course, the reply would have to be, do you have a rubber ducky? <laughs> yeah, USB drops against an InfoSec crowd. That's what we actually decided to do. To see how we fared as an industry against this very very popular form of attack. And we're not the first to do this. Uh, the Google Anti-Fraud and Abuse Research team did just such an attack against a university campus and presented their findings at Black Hat in 2016. Uh, and they identified these key factors to making a successful uh, USB drop attack. And they actually found that a USB hid spoofing or keystroke injection attack or lying and saying you're in, and showing up as a keyboard instead of a thumb drive is actually a, a really nice sweet spot between you know, the cost and complexity, uh, complexity, the reliability, the stealth factor, you know, cross-platform, all of those things that are important to having a good attack as stacked up against social engineering, for instance. Pretty low cost, right? Pretty easy to just walk into a bank, mm -hmm. right? Uh, not nearly as stealth no. and not necessarily as reliable. Zero days, on the other hand, those are great. Those are, you know, can be highly reliable. They can be highly stealthy but they are tremendously costly. 
not just in dollars and time, and they're not really just like littering the streets, <laughs> like it could be with thumb drives. Right. So uh, Eli Bernstein of Google's anti-abuse research team identified some unique challenges. Basically, cross-platformness, binary list persistence, and creating realistic keys as their unique challenges for a USB drop against this university. Mm -hmm. All right, so how did we go about solving these different kind of challenges? Well, first off, we had to identify our objectives. Obviously, the Google anti-fraud and abuse research team, they wanted to do reverse shells. But the difference is they are Google and we are Hack5. We don't have a slew of lawyers to back us up if we decided to get a reverse shell and then find some kind of trade secrets or hack the Gibson. We just didn't want to let that happen. So we decided to make it quite easy and help should be security minded people with a little bit of security awareness. We didn't want to have any kind of malicious intent because well, that would be bad and then we would have to get lawyers involved. So we didn't want to go that way. Our primary objective here was not to use reverse shells for any kind of nefarious fun later on down the road. We just wanted to educate people with a simple pop-up of a web page and show them that there are actual risks of plugging in USB drives. So on those uh, key factors, cross-platformness, typically just OS fingerprinting, figuring out, hey, is this a Mac, is this a Windows, is this a Linux, and then injecting a different set of keystrokes dependent on your target. Uh, the binary list persistence, well, thankfully, we didn't even need to worry about that, but that's obviously you know, setting up a reverse shell with some sort of intelligence and persistence to maintain that connection, to get that reconnection, and then obviously not use you know, stupid simple protocols, not use Meterpreter on port 4444 and get noticed, you know, add a little stealth to that. Uh, we didn't have to do any of that since we just wanted to pop up a web page. Mm -hmm. So instead, we just put together a very simple ducky script. In you can take a picture of that too if you want to. Text editor ever. Uh, <laughs> and this Ducky script is really simple. It's cross platform without having to identify the operating system because we're just sending the keystrokes that'll work against, well, let's say we just identified the three major operating systems we were concerned about. So, Windows, everything since Windows 98, uh, I guess it would have to be SE to have USB support, uh, OS X, as well as, well, if you're running Linux, we just said Unity. So mm -hmm. Alt F2 for Unity, uh, Command Space for Mac, and Windows Key R for Windows. And then we just type a URL and hit Enter. And of course, for convenience, it's just going to pop up the default browser and take them to a web page. So of course, we had to set up a web page. So we threw together a little bit of PHP that just very simply uh, grabs the browser information and a little IP information. You know, nothing nefarious just to determine the operating system and just to get an idea of the geolocation, right? And then the rest of it is just a, a bunch of meta stuff in JavaScript to do a forwarder to take them on to some good advice. Where do you guys find good advice? I don't know. CERT. Oh. So I took them to the US CERT, <laughs> which has a nice security bulletin tip on USB drive security, which states, don't plug them in. <laughs> Just you, don't do it. If you find one, take it to the proper authorities. Take them to your systems administrator. <laughs> right. So that, that covers binary list persistence mm -hmm. and cross-platform. We also needed to make sure it was realistic. Yes. Because it's important that your hardware is realistic. You know, it's very unlikely that somebody's just going to pick one of these up off the street and then plug it into their computers, right? right. But one of these... Oh, that's trustworthy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's in a plastic case. Right, and obviously you can't 3D print a plastic case, yeah? Yeah. No. <laughs> so realistic looking drive, yeah, we did that already. A USB automation tool that you created way back in the day in 2006, it was called the USB Switchblade. That one was based off off-the-shelf flash drives that looked exactly like this one, a SanDisk. It looked like a drive because, well, it, want, it was one. So then after that, Darren created the USB rubber ducky a few years later, which was the next level of keystroke injection tools. And this one was supposed to be a turnkey solution for penetration testers, something that you could easily bring anywhere because it looks so generic. I mean, no hacker device that looks like a USB rubber ducky is going to draw suspicion, generally. But of 
course, if it looks like a thumb drive and it smells like a thumb drive and it tastes like a thumb drive, don't put that in your mouth. Then it must be a thumb drive, right? Yeah. So we also had to consider some additional factors when we did this drop. Uh, first off, where would we put these drops? Where would we choose to drop the USB flash drives? Of course, that's a very important factor. Second off, we have social engineering. We're going into this target-rich environment, so what do we do when we're there? We decided to go against everybody with distracting and redirecting their attention while we drop the USB flash drives. And third is complexity of the payload, which Darren already mentioned. He wanted to keep it short and sweet, just launching a URL. That's it. And of course, number four would be make sure that it's reliable. So we had to make sure that we had less graphical user interface elements changing throughout time and conservative delays to account for any kind of slower machines because not everybody has a quick machine made in 2017, for example. Also on the front of reliability, we needed to spoof an Apple aluminum keyboard because OS X is going to complain if you're not using Apple's own products. And that's, well, spoofing, that's just as easy as spoofing a keyboard. There's a VID and a PID associated with every USB device, a vendor ID right. and a product ID. And those are just eight characters that you send down the bus, and there will be that inherent trust just as there is inherent trust to those unauthentic keystrokes. And the result is a payload that's highly reliable, that will work against most computers, and it will happen in an instant faster than you have a chance, reasonably, to unplug it and prevent it from doing its bidding. So we should discuss the attack. Or maybe we should show them. Let's do that. So much fun doing that. It was so enjoyable. <laughs> so obviously, as you can tell, that was RSA 2017, which takes place in San Francisco in February of every year. Uh, this co conference has about 43,000 professionals that attend, with 550 different brand name companies that have booths on the show floor. There's tons of different people that attend, and all of them are information security professionals. They might be chief officers from different brands. They might be analysts, press, and PR. But all of them are working in some kind of infosec genre in one way or another. So all of them have an idea of how to secure themselves. So we took 100 duckies to the RSA conference, and we decided to kind of figure out how many would be picked up and plugged in. That's pretty much all we wanted to know. Now, we could not determine who and where they picked them up, and we could track how many were picked up, when and where they ended up, wherever that might be in the world. So then we had to consider some drop locations. That was one of my favorites. <laughs> so we did swag bowls, of course. That was an excellent place to put different USB rubber duckies. Candy bowls were very popular at the convention. Uh, we found one that had little chip clips that you put on your, on your bags of chips. And I put two or three drives in there, checked back later, just walked by, and they were all gone. Somebody picked up the flash drives. It was great. Uh, if I did see a USB drive swag bowl, of course I put some in there because everybody uses the same kind of USB flash drives. They all look the same, so it was perfect. Attendee bags just like this one were great because they give those away at the front of the convention for t-shirts and business cards and flyers and whatever else they can find. So that was a perfect place because you just drop it in and walk away. And of course, charging and lounge areas. There were plenty of those and I thought, hmm, easy pickings. Just leave it right there and assume that somebody accidentally left it. But we did have some caveats that we had to consider. So the first caveat was, Bathrooms, as you saw, were a great place to leave them, but if you leave one all by itself with nothing around it, people will tweet about it, including this person. So I have a tip for this, a pro tip. Like I did in the video, leave one on top of a booth flyer. It looks a lot less suspicious. I love that the majority of the replies were, plug it in. <laughs> what could go wrong? What could go wrong? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> Caveat I'll... number two was don't go in as a recognizable security figure, especially if you have purple hair. Yeah, you get noticed pretty quickly. <laughs> You'll get noticed. Also, if you're going to do this kind of thing uh, on a more general audience than your own internal organization, put an email address within the code because you will inevitably get emails from other security researchers saying, <laughs> thanks for dropping by our booth. <laughs> Ended up being that they were uh, big fans of the USB rubber ducks and they were like, hey, thanks for the hardware. Where else did you leave them? <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a quick look at the analysis because we did drop 100 drives. And this is what we found. We ended up with 162 unique executions from 62 different unique IP addresses that ended up in about five different nations over wow. the course of 65 days, right? That's so insane. I, I love that even up until like, you know, April, these were still being plugged in. Why? So, <laughs> and, and, you know, as you might imagine, majority Windows, some Mac, majority Chrome, very little MSIE. So, you know, yay, good right. to see that. So if we did a similar drop test to this one, we decided that there would be a few things that we would have to consider and a few things that we would probably do a lot better. Since the USB rubber ducky payload was exactly the same on every single device, and we had 100 devices, there was no way for us to determine which device was being used, so we couldn't tell which location was best. So we think that a unique URL for each one would be a lot better. We should also block bots. I'm talking yes. to the guy with the curl script that decided to <laughs> hammer on the, uh, the page, but that's OK. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. throw out the bogus data. <laughs> We could also add some kind of legitimate looking URL to the front of them. It's very, very easy in these days to screen print on the front of those with uh, laser branding. So you can put a legitimate looking logo on your USB rubber ducky flash drives. And so I would say overall, this is pretty successful security awareness engagement considering 62 unique executions out of 100 drives dropped. That's so bad. It's so awesome. I don't know. It's it's so it, 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 it tickles me pink. <laughs> so you're probably wondering how our industry has actually responded to this kind of attack. Oh, Shannon, they have absolutely embraced this kind of attack. It has really? been, yeah, the USB, you know, attack platform has been, you know, it's been weaponized by nation states on numerous mm. high-profile attacks. Remember last year I talked about Stuxnet, the yeah. first known cyber weapon? Well, that's offense, though. Yeah, but USB propagation. Oh, okay, how about Cottonmouth from the NSA? Since the Snowden leaks and we got the uh, Ant catalog, we could tell, yeah. dude, that thing is used for infiltration and exfiltration cool. over covert wireless channels. That's also offense. Yeah, but covert wireless channels. And it's great, but it's offense. Okay, well, they're also <laughs> charging a million dollars for a few of them, so we're not, we're not uh, charging enough for these things. Apparently. <laughs> okay, how about the recent Vault 7 drops on uh, WikiLeaks? I'm quoting the CIA here. The USB rubber ducky is well crafted both through its software and hardware. The software has a nice interface for users and comes with a good amount of documentation and, exa and examples online. Yay! So apparently the CIA is now doing our free advertisement, so that's great. <laughs> so state espionage has obviously decided to use this as a great attack vector, but how has information security gone about thwarting these kind of attacks? Well, seriously, not the best. Um, <laughs> I would say that it's really cool. We've seen some some unique enthusiast hardware. Uh, this is the USG, it's a USB firewall. And I think it's really cool. Uh, it has some caveats. Unfortunately, it only supports USB 1.1. Uh, unfortunately, it only does mass storage <laughs> and mouse and keyboard. So, right. But it's still, it's an open hardware, open source project. I don't see it becoming huge adoption, but it's kind of cool to, uh, to see a response to this kind of threat. Right. On the software side, I've seen a new, just so many of these suites out there to help whitelist USB drives. But as I talked about, about spoofing the Apple aluminum keyboard, it's just a matter of sending a spoofed vendor ID and product ID, a few other things to mimic a legitimate drive. Uh, and again, that's just telling the right lie. So we're going to go ahead and give you guys a, uh, this payload so you can use it on your own internal security awareness engagements. Uh, as well as this uh, website we set up and the slides and the talk. Actually, don't use our website, but you know, host it yourself, obviously. It's just PHP. Uh, <laughs> so that'll be at hack5.org slash USB drop after this talk. I'm going to make sure it's actually there after the talk. I'm the one that manages this guy. So if you think this is scary, consider something else. We just have been talking about the human interface device potential of the USB attack vector using a USB rubber ducky. But think about the Bash Bunny. That's our newest product out here. 
And of course, we're not standing up here just to advertise this, but to make you think about the possibilities in the future. The Bash Bunny doesn't just emulate a keyboard, but also serial. It emulates storage and a driverless network adapter. So if you're thinking, I'm safe because I have an air-gapped Windows 7 or XP box, it's totally safe from WannaCry, just imagine, if you have a USB stick like the Bash Bunny that the victim computer is inherently going to trust as an authoritative network, obtain an IP address, expose its SMB protocol, yeah, you're owned. That's all you have to do. So we give you some takeaway thoughts. First off, if we as information security professionals cannot be trusted to follow flash drive security best practices and protocols, how are we going to expect our own users to follow this as well? I mean, look at RSA conference, 62 unique IPs. Yeah, but that wouldn't happen here at all, sir, obviously. Of course not. no, no. Are the safeguards that we are implementing to protect our organizations, are they best on technology or policy or both? And are we giving humans too much credit and responsibility when it comes to the security of our systems? Consider those. When you really get down to it, you know, securing systems is about ensuring trust. And exploiting systems is about breaking trust. And in the case of these USB flash drives, this USB drop example, we're taking advantage of the, the, the trade-off between convenience and security, and we're putting that trust into humans. The responsibility is on the human to identify the hardware and make sure what they're plugging in isn't lying and actually being a keyboard. I mean, hacking, after all, is all about trust. And as in life, trust takes time to build and to rebuild. And trust can easily be washed away in an instant. Mm -hmm. So we as an industry need to think about where we're putting our trust in our security systems. We've gotten really good at building very secure machine-to-machine -machine mechanisms, right. right? But it's those endpoints where the machines meet the humans that we need to start asking the questions, where are we putting our trust? Well, I can tell you where I'm putting my trust. I'm trusting my Technolust. Thank you guys. so much. <laughs>